At the start of the Second World War, the German army proved itself once again the most powerful in Europe, able to flatten all opposition. The German Air Force, the most up-to-date in Europe, proved a formidable partner of the army in waging lightning war. But the German service which came closest to defeating Britain was the German Navy, relatively small and starved of funds. The near victory of the U-boats in the Atlantic is well remembered. What's almost forgotten is that Germany nearly strangled Britain's seaborne trade at the very start of the war by using the first of Hitler's secret weapons. On September the 3rd, 1939, within minutes of Britain's declaration of war, the German Navy began to lay mines in the North Sea. Most were of the buoyant type used in the First World War. They could be anchored to the seabed to float at various depths. If a ship bumped into them, they exploded. The target of the German mining offensive was the shipping lanes, along which flowed 50 million tonnes of goods a year. They could be blocked by mines. The east coast lane, down which hundreds of ships brought to London its supply of northern coal, was most heavily attacked. The German Navy gave mining the highest priority. They ordered other types of warship to help the purpose-built mine layers. They used motor torpedo boats and destroyers. And they used U-boats to creep into harbors and estuaries where other ships might have been spotted. In one of the U-boats was Captain Meckel. I was commanding officer of U-19 in September, October, 1939, and I laid mines around Inner Dowsing Lightship in the estuary of the Humber. This operation was uh, rather successful because on nine mines, three ships were sunk. The mines were loaded into the torpedo tubes and pushed out from the submerged boat. The steamship Magdapur was the first victim on September the 10th of Alderborough. Others followed. Mines are laid in shallow waters. At low tide, parts of the shipping lanes were a graveyard of masts and funnels. The toll in lives was just as grim, and a stream of shock survivors began to flow from rescue ships into hospitals ashore. Fred Brody was serving on a destroyer. We were told to leave Harwich because the harbour entrance had been mined. And uh, we left in Lionhead formation, three ships. The first ship passed, well, we were told to pass to the wrong side of a certain boy. And the first ship did pass to the wrong side of that boy. The gypsy who was following the stern of her hit the boy and passed to the right side of it. And she immediately started to go astern, realizing that she was going into danger. We were astern of Gypsy, and we swung clear of Gypsy and went to the wrong side of the boy. And as we passed Gypsy, she blew up. And she blew up amidships by about number one boiler room. And the flame and uh, smoke all poured up out of the from the forward funnel. And um, I could see the men running on the upper deck as she started to settle and go down. And she settled on the harbour bottom. And we passed on then. We had to get away out of it because we didn't know how many mines had been laid. And the harbour craft came up, picked up survivors. You immediately start wondering whether there are any more mines in the area and whether you're going to be the next ship to go up. It's rather a terrifying feeling. Well, for the people on board the ships, the particular nastiness is the uncertainty. You never know when a mine is going to go up underneath you.
the danger is always there. You can never rest. Some ships were damaged by what seemed like mine explosions, but they didn't sink. With help, they managed to make harbor. They had no great hole in the hull, but steel plates had split like eggshells. It was as though a giant sledgehammer had hit the ship. In dry dock, water poured out like a sieve. On this tanker, a heavy iron paravane snapped in two. Castings cracked. A windlass handle broke off. Rivets were forced out of plates. People talked of a new type of mine, a secret weapon. This may be someone's much heralded secret weapon. If so, I must concede in the first round. But this is going to be a combat where only the last round ends and there will be no need for any referee to decide who has won that. Mine sweeping and mine warfare was the job of a Royal Navy shore establishment in Portsmouth, HMS Vernon. Here, technical officers were assessing evidence for the existence of a new weapon. One was Lieutenant Commander Ouvry. One of the ships was heavily damaged but was not sunk. And then again, the Belfast was not holed, but her back was broken. Therefore, it seemed that something had exploded, not in contact with her hull, but clear of her hull, and that it was the influence of the ship that had caused the mine to explode. Such a mine was known as an influence mine. All this time, British minesweepers had been scouring the North Sea, hoping to recover a mine of this type. They used the ordinary type of sweep, a line trailed from a float well behind and to one side of the ship. The line can be trailed at various depths, so as to cut the anchor cable of moored mines, forcing them to the surface. They recovered many mines, but all were of the contact type. None were influence mines. German mines washed up on the east coast were investigated by teams from HMS Vernon. In October and November, they investigated over 200. Pockets were emptied of jangling metal objects in case the mine was magnetic or acoustic. But they all turned out to be ordinary contact mines. Shipping losses from mines in the first two months totaled 200,000 tonnes. But this figure doesn't give a true measure of the damage to the nation. Britain had to import one million tons of supplies a week to keep her people fed and her war industries working. Dozens of ships had to enter harbour each day to load or unload. Convoys, which had struggled across the Atlantic with their precious cargo, were threatened with destruction just as they neared their home ports. Mines were deliberately laid in the narrow approaches to harbours where shipping had to concentrate. Once a ship struck a mine, the whole area had to be closed while safe channels were found. Several east coast ports were closed for days at a time, as was Liverpool. And while the ships marked time, they became an easier prey to U-boats and, from November 1939, to a new menace. The German Air Force was ordered to begin attacks on convoys, especially along the east coast. November 1939, the mining campaign built up to a crisis. November the 13th, the cruiser Adventure mined in the Thames estuary, together with her escort destroyer Blanche and four other ships. 
November the 15th, the Dutch steamer Bolivar. November the 16th, the Japanese liner Terukuni Maru. November the 20th, the cruiser Belfast, her back broken. November the 21st, the Italian ship Fiannona. With 15 ships sunk in five days, the Humber was closed. 70 ships were immobilized in the Thames, 200 off Dover. Here, the minesweeper Aragonite went down, the latest casualty in the frantic search for the mystery mine. And one of the trawlers converted into minesweepers, the Mastiff, had blown up in a heroic attempt to dredge up a mine with a fishing net. The outlook was grim. That very week, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, spoke to the nation. We are in a very different position from that we were in 10 weeks ago. We are far stronger than we were 10 weeks ago. We are far better prepared to endure the worst malice of Hitler and his Huns than we were at the beginning of September. Confident in public, behind the scenes gravely concerned, Churchill called a crisis meeting at the Admiralty. Unless a way of sweeping the mystery mine was found soon, defeat would follow. But to devise a sweep, the Navy had to recover an intact specimen. At any cost, added Churchill. Then, on the night of November the 21st, the Germans launched what could have been the death blow. They began laying mines from aircraft. Observers on the East Coast reported parachutes with what looked like sailors' kit bags attached to them. The next night, one was seen to drop in the Thames estuary. I was sitting in the DMS, Director of Mine Sweeping's office, and at about half past 10 to 11, he told me to go and get a bit of sleep. So I went down to a hotel in Northumberland Avenue, and after about half an hour, I had a telephone call saying, proceed to the Admiralty as soon as you possibly can, join up with the 10th Commander Lewis, and you'll be required to go down to Shoebury Ness with him and deal with what is thought to be a German mine. Lieutenant Commander Lewis was another Vernon officer. They were intending to drop the mines in, in South End Roads where there were a lot of merchant ships at anchor. These two landed on a mud flat. Part of the inter-service artillery range manned by the army at Shubri Ness. So we had army personnel available as working party. We had workshops available. We had transport available which could operate on the mud. We had photographers available. We had every single facility that we could possibly have. They couldn't have chosen a better spot so far as Great Britain was concerned. There we met Commander Mayton, who was all ready for us with waders and coats and torches and uh, about 10 soldiers with more lights and ropes. And we're told that there was almost certain to be a mine visible about 400 yards out from where we were and that a soldier who had seen this mine fall into the water, or rather drop into the water under a parachute, had a pretty good idea where it was, and he would lead us out to this mine. I felt utterly and absolutely excited to the nth degree. Well, I mean, we had been working for 24 hours, the situation was serious, and here was our goal approaching in the dark. It was a wet night, and there was no light, so it was all rather a sort of ghostly slosh across the mud. What took place that night and the next day is reenacted with the original mine by present day Army and Navy personnel. We stopped the army who were with us with their torches as soon as we could locate the mine and Uwe and I just walked on alone, feeling very, very lonely people. We looked at it extremely carefully. Now this I largely left to Uwe because he was far more qualified at pulling mines to pieces than I was. In fact, I had never pulled a mine to pieces in my life. 
There were two fittings on the top of the mine, which obviously had to be removed to render the mine safe. One was made of brass, with a small brass spindle sticking out of it, it was pretty obviously a hydrostatic valve. The other one I did not recognize. It was polished aluminum with a brass securing ring and a little copper strip sticking out of it. Now this really worried me because I'd never seen anything like it before. This, to me, would, is going to be public enemy number one. Lewis pulled a signal pad out of his pocket and made a rubbing of this fitting. The idea being that we could then have a pin spanner made at the workshops ashore and when daylight came we'd have a spanner at least we could unscrew that uh, particular fitting. By this time a, a chief petty officer and an able seaman from Vernon with, with some mine recovery tools had arrived and Ouvre and the chief petty officer, chief officer Baldwin decided to form one team and remove the first fitting. And the able seaman and I were to watch at, very carefully at a reasonable distance and make notes of what we thought they were doing. So much was at stake. Their orders were to recover the mine at any cost. When we got to the mine, I really wasn't afraid as such, but just absolutely keyed up and determined. What I was worried about was that aluminum fitting. then got hold of it with my hand and very carefully lifted it up. I thought it might be a magnetic needle or some, some magnetic device, so I lifted it up very slowly so as not to move it quickly in the Earth's magnetic field. I thought that might be fatal. When I got it clear of the mine itself, I saw underneath a polished cup screwed into the, the bottom of this fitting, which was aluminum. And that I recognized as a gain or form of detonator. If the mine had gone off over and, and Baldwin had disappeared too, an explosion like that w in that mud would, I should think, make a hole about a cricket pitch in diameter and about six or seven feet deep. The next thing I should do was to call in Lewis and Verncombe, the able seaman, turn over the mine and start on the two fittings underneath. The spring in the tail was to eject the parachute.
brass rod. That plate was quite easily removed with four screws. And underneath, there was a fitting which we didn't recognize. And we had to use quite considerable force to get this out. Underneath that was another screwed bun, on the top of which were two little blocks with terminals on them, with colored wires. And they, they led into the body of the mine. And so I parted those by twisting and then insulated them. Now we had to remove this, what looked really like a detonator carrier, but I wasn't sure. And I did this with a large screwdriver sent up from Vernon, a non-magnetic screwdriver. This came away quite reasonably easily, and when, we, when I got it clear, I saw on the bottom of the thing a German detonator, which I recognized. And we, we were absolutely delighted, because now we'd apparently removed two dangerous things from the mine, one an unrecognized detonator, and now an ordinary detonator. We felt on top of the world at that moment. Under the spring was a recognized priming charge, 
which is necessary to explode the main charge when the detonator itself is fired. We had not much difficulty in unscrewing the, the keep ring and lifted this thing out. And it was connected by something inside the mine by five colored leads. These we severed as usual and insulated them. And now we had the fittings clear of the mine and we looked upon our job for the moment uh, as complete. The next thing to do was to send the mine ashore. So I signaled to the soldiers on, on the beach to send out a caterpillar tractor with a crane and very shortly they came out and loaded the mine onto the tractor. We ourselves then walked inshore with our four fittings. It was rather like, rather like you feel after you've finished some intensely physical exertion and won. The mine arrived at Portsmouth on the following evening, November the 24th. It was taken to a laboratory at HMS Vernon, where a small team of scientists would finally discover how it worked. The fact of its recovery was to remain a closely guarded secret. Churchill had ordered work to proceed day and night. In the event, one night was enough. A metal fairing was removed, disclosing a rear door, ringed with bolts. they found an aluminium dome set in a rubber diaphragm. At this stage, the experts thought they were about to uncover an acoustic mechanism, one triggered off by the sound of a ship. Under the dome, a scale was revealed with the word Gauss. Gauss is the unit of magnetic measurement. The mine was magnetic. The mechanism was slung on gimbals in an aluminium frame. Inside this oblong aluminium box, 
was a flat magnet, which acted rather like a compass needle, except that it swung vertically on its pivots, not horizontally. This demonstration shows how it worked. Steel ships behave like a magnet. When a ship passed over the mine, the needle was repelled downwards, closing an electrical circuit which exploded the mine. The last fitting Ouvry had removed was in fact a clock. If the mine fell into the sea, water seeped through the hydrostatic valve and its pressure started the mechanism. This ran for 24 minutes before connecting a battery to the electrical circuit. But the detonator had to be armed, that is, brought into contact with the priming charge, which has to explode in order to set off the mine's main charge. Arming is brought about by water pressure. As water seeps through the hydrostatic valve, it pushes a plate. This forces the spring plunger to push rings of primer explosive round the detonator. With the detonator armed and the battery switched on by the clock, it only requires a passing ship to deflect the needle downwards, closing the circuit to detonate the mine. The first fitting Ouvry had removed had nothing to do with this circuit. It was a separate detonator, intended to prevent the mine being recovered by an enemy. The copper strip on the top was a safety device. It should have been torn off before the mine was dropped. If it fell into the sea, water pressure stopped it working. But if it fell on land, after seven seconds, any jolt would detonate it and the mine. Seldom have so few men won so important a victory. On December the 19th, 1939, King George VI visited Portsmouth and HMS Vernon. He bestowed the first naval decorations of the war. Lewis got the DSO, and so did Ouvry. Baldwin and Verncombe got the DSM. Now that the mine had yielded up its secrets, the urgent task was to find a method of sweeping it. In the five weeks after Shubriness, they experimented with five different methods of mine sweeping. First, they tried towing a wire on the surface between two ships. Dangling from the wire on rope pennants were bar magnets. The idea was to trail the magnets above the seabed and hope they'd trigger off the mines. This sweep triggered off a mine on November the 30th, but it had serious snags. When the magnets were together on board before putting overboard, they all stuck together. When you were sweeping, the magnets were supposed to be six feet from the bottom, and as the tide rose and fell, you had to take the sweep all together in, adjust the length of the pennants, and then put it out again so that it was, seem, from a seamanship point of view, a thoroughly nasty job of work, and we dubbed it the boatswain's nightmare. Three days later, they were using a non-magnetic ship to tow a barge carrying an electric coil supplied with power from the ship. This created a strong magnetic field. It blew mines up all right, but the barge often went down. Then they tried the mine destructor ship, a converted collier. This had an electromagnet in her bows weighing 500 tons. It was intended to project a magnetic field forward and explode mines well ahead of the ship. It exploded its first mine on January the 4th, 1940, but still suffered considerable damage. The pilot's nightmare was the RAF contribution, Wellington bombers fitted with a magnetic coil weighing two and a half tons and fed with current from a large generator. It exploded its first mine on January the 8th, but it had to fly almost at sea level, risking its own destruction. Their use in British waters was soon abandoned, and they spent the rest of the war keeping the Suez Canal clear of mines. The problem was to find a sweep which didn't damage the sweeper. Meanwhile, Dr. Charles Goodeve, a Canadian scientist turned sailor, had been developing another idea. A non-magnetic ship would tow two lengths of cable, 
one long, one short, with an electrode at the end, one positive, one negative. Current from the ship would pass from one cable to the other, flowing through the sea in mid-circuit. The magnetic field this created would explode mines without endangering the ship. They called it the double L sweep. Would it work? Sir Charles Goodeve. The secret of the, of the double L sweep was that the currents partly went through cables and partly went through the sea. You could control what went through the cables, but you couldn't control what went through the sea. It had to do what it wanted itself. Uh, and that was the question, what, did it, what would it do? So we had to, had to determine that. Uh, actually, Lord Charwell, who was an advisor to Winston Churchill, uh, his scientific advisor, um, <laughs> did some calculations uh, and uh, showed that, uh, that the currents through the sea would go the wrong way and go compensate everything that was being done in the cables. The crucial experiment to prove the feasibility of the double L sweep took place on a December morning on the Canoe Lake at South Sea. I don't know of any other lake, <laughs> uh, pleasure lake, which is made of, filled with salt water. But salt, of course, makes, uh, has a very big effect on the conductivity of water. In fact, if there's no salt, there's practically no conductivity at all. You couldn't operate the double L in a freshwater river, for example, uh, here, because it doesn't conduct the current well enough. That December morning, passers-by would have been surprised to see model ships being towed backwards and forwards by sailors. This is what the public were meant to see. The sailors were part of a cover plan. They'd been told they were testing a method for detecting enemy ships. Meanwhile, the real experiment was taking place. On the floor of the lake were two cables, connected to batteries in a lorry. When the sailors had created enough diversion, Goodeve's assistants rowed across the area where the cables lay. In the boat was a box, connected to the magnetic unit of the Shubriness mine. When the current was switched on, it flowed between the cables, precisely as Goodeve had predicted. The instrument showed the resulting magnetic field was strong enough to detonate the mine. So we were able then to go and report at once to the Admiralty Committee uh, that this was a winner, that we could go ahead now. And we got to go ahead that day. That was the day that Lord Charwell uh, also put in a report saying that it wouldn't work. For this experiment, the cables were on the floor of the lake, the mine on the surface. But the operational sweep would need cables on the surface, floating cable. None was known to exist. They had a go anyway. We had to tow. 500 yards of one inch electric cable supported by a series of spars tied together with wire strops and towing 500 yards of that round the Thames estuary and getting it off a beach with groins and breakwaters on it in the very cold winter of 1939-40 was a thankless task and an impossible task, and we never got it over a mine. A desperate call went out to two British cable manufacturers. Both were able to come up with a solution. One of them gave the copper cable buoyancy by using tennis balls. The first floating cable was ready in three weeks and went into quantity production. By early February, the double L sweep was at sea. The sweep exploded its first mine off Yarmouth on February the 10th, 1940. In the final version, two ships were used, each towing two cables. The ships pulsed in current simultaneously for six seconds at a time, enough to explode any mines. Each pulse cleared 10 acres of seabed leaving a channel 300 yards wide for other ships to follow in safety. The double L sweep was so successful, it made all other methods against magnetic mines redundant. 300 mine sweepers were quickly built to carry it. But while this astonishing effort was going on, scientists were also working at full speed on making ships immune by demagnetizing them. The lines of force of the Earth's magnetic field are represented here by white lines. 
the strength of the field in a given area is shown by the number of lines. The more the lines, the stronger the field. The German mine was set to remain inactive in the Earth's normal magnetic field, but a steel ship increases the strength of the Earth's field beneath it. Measured in a unit called a milligauss, the strength of the field under the ship can be plotted as a curve. The curve is known as the ship's magnetic signature. The German mine was set to go off at about 50 milligauss. It would explode right under the middle of most ships. Demagnetization aimed at reducing the magnetic signature to a harmless level. Within a few days of recovering the Schuberness mine, experiments were begun on the cruise of Manchester. They showed that a ship's magnetism can be neutralized by fastening a coil of copper cable around the hull and passing a current through it. It wasn't a moment too soon. On December the 4th, the mightiest ship in the Navy, the flagship Nelson, triggered off a mine at the home fleet anchorage, Loch U. This shocking blow was kept secret, but it spurred the Admiralty. On December the 10th, it ordered coils to be fitted to all warships. Britain's whole output of suitable copper cable was requisitioned. A start was also made on merchant ships. One of the first was the liner Queen Elizabeth. The date of her maiden voyage to the United States early in March 1940 had been secret, but when she arrived in New York, the coil was seen round the outside of her bows. The story broke in the press. The Germans now knew countermeasures were underway, but the publicity had a tonic effect on Allied morale. A new word was coined, de-gaussing. Sailors soon learned its meaning. Donald Henley was a de-gaussing officer. Uh, the chap had a, uh, quite a small ship, had a de-gaussing coil on, and he came alongside the uh, a key and switched off his de-gaussing coil and blew himself up. There was a mine nearby. In other words, he was quite safe while it was on. But when he switched off, his, his uh, field increased by a power of about, a multiplication of about five, which was enough to trigger the mine. To know how much current to put into the coils, it was necessary to measure the magnetic signature of ships with precision. De-gaussing ranges were laid across the mouths of harbours. They consisted of a string of detector units like these laid under water and linked to a station on shore. As a ship entered or left harbour, it passed over the detectors. Instruments measured the magnetic field under the ship and a photographic trace was recorded and rapidly developed. Okay. Yes. The shape of the magnetic signature could be seen and data for its correction signaled to the ship. As data accumulated, techniques of coiling improved rapidly. Another scientist at the Vernon was Sir Edward Bullard. We started off with the obvious idea of tying wires around the outside of the ship and demagnetizing it so the ships wouldn't fire the mines. And this uh, turned out to work very well, but not unexpectedly. The wires were washed off the outside of the ship by the waves, and we had to keep replacing them. And then we gradually shifted them a little higher up the ship and found they still worked. We came round just on the deck inside the rails and found they still worked. And one day we said, well, why don't we try it inside? And we found that worked too. And then suddenly one day I realized that if we'd known anything about electromagnetism, uh, we should have seen this from the start. I have never had such a red face in my life as when I suddenly realized that you could even put the things in steel tubes and it would still work. It wouldn't be screened from the outside. Extraordinary gap in our knowledge. I think the reason was that most physicists were interested in other things and none of us really knew much about the problems. Scientific modesty can't obscure the value of degaussing coils in saving countless ships and countless lives throughout the war. Uh, I myself have seen a, a, a merchant ship's crew refuse to put to sea because the uh, DG coil had been damaged and was out of action due to manoeuvring tanks in the hold. 
and the tank had gone through the coil. And they literally refused to go to sea until something was done. Uh, fortunately, the electricians were able to work all night and uh, get this uh, car repaired because as I, I personally spoke to the chief engineer who said he considered it, it was no joke because he'd been in the sea twice through mining. He didn't reckon he'd survive the third time. But even fitting coils at the rate of 200 a week couldn't give protection fast enough to the 10,000 ships in Lloyd's register. And in any case, there were many small ships without the generating power to keep a coil permanently energized. Many of these were coastal craft, most at risk from mines. Once again, the answer came from Dr. Goodeve. By January 1940, he'd devised a simpler process for demagnetizing. The ship was brought alongside a degaussing station. A cable was slung along one side of the hull and lowered to the keel. Flash, 1,000 amps. A huge current was switched into the cable. As the cable moved up, the huge current neutralized the magnetism in the steel plates. The process came to be known as wiping. It only gave protection for six months, but several small ships could be done in a day. Degassing was carried out on a massive scale. In five months, a thousand ships were wiped, 2,000 were equipped with coils. I had uh, about 50 um, laborers of various kinds, as well as the, the crew of the, of the vessel, and. Uh, we worked them as long as they, they, they could work um, we, till 10 or 11 o'clock at night and they turned to about 6 in the morning. Saturdays, Sundays, all days. In May 1940, a thousand small ships sailed to Dunkirk to rescue the British Expeditionary Force. The shallow waters along the beaches were an ideal location for magnetic mines. Many of the ships were without degaussing coils. All the Vernon's personnel were mobilized, scientists, sailors, laborers. In four days and nights, they degaussed 400 ships by wiping. The result confirmed the value of all they'd done in the hectic six months since Hubriness. Of the 235 ships lost at Dunkirk, only two were sunk by mines. The cooperation between scientists and the Navy, forged in the deadly struggle against the magnetic mine, held promise of greater victories in the future.